Ja, mach du, mach du alles, ne? Super. Sehr schön. Das ist ihre Geschichte. Deshalb ist sie wieder auf der Der ist der Dropbox-Link. Ja, ihr könnt alle mal Für das ist Ja? Super. Ja, sehr schön. Wir wollen reden dann hier so. Ja, okay, vielen Dank dir. Das war sehr gut. Sehr gut. Okay, das machen wir. Ja, machen wir es so. Ja, das ist auch mal deine Geschichte. and challenges. As mentioned, my main field of research is copyright law and at the uh, University of Krems we are 
also having a comp comprehensive uh, research project on a blockchain implemented solution. It's called Data Market Austria, where we are working together with the Austrian Institute of Technology and with stakeholders from the business environment to provide a data trading platform <coughs> which combines legal methods and also uh, technical implementations of blockchain technology to make a sound and safe uh, environment for trading data in the Austrian economy. So it's very interesting for me to to speak on copyright foundations here. I want to uh, address challenges and potentials that uh, I perceive when we talk about blockchain technology, technical solutions, and uh, open science, in science in general, and I want to especially focus on the perspective of um, copyright. So, when we talk about copyright in, in science in general, it is always important to stress the basic principle that there is no copyright protection in uh, the information, in ideas, in the knowledge, in historical, technical facts, in data itself. So all of these subjects are not protected by copyright. These are the core principles of knowledge transfer, of knowledge dissemination. Uh, so there should not be a, mono a monopoly on these core uh, aspects of, of, of knowledge, of a knowledge society, so there is no protection in this element, which also means whenever we talk about taking mere ideas, mere information, mere knowledge of something that is protected, and we take just the information, just the ideas, the principles out of it, this is not subject to copyright. However, um, we are very soon uh, getting into the, the, the sphere of copyright protection, so when we then talk about uh, something that's protected by copyright, when we not take these this core subjects, the information itself, but the information, the idea, the knowledge in its mediated version. So whenever we have information that's now conveyed in a mediated form, for example in a written document or in a oral speech or in pictures whatsoever, then of course we're in copyright protection. And copyright protection requires protected works. I just listed uh, the most important for, for the academical sphere, for scientific publishing. Uh, when I indicated the Austrian provisions, the same holds true for the German provisions. Of course, the, 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 the paragraphs are different, but uh, the, the, in fact, it's, it's the same legal situation also in uh, the other European countries and uh, the basic principles also on the, on the, on the international level. We, of course, can have uh, literary works protected by copyright, uh, written documents, novels, scientific articles, papers, whatsoever, oral speeches. Uh, this also contains computer programs, also computer programs, of course, very important for, for science. Also protected as literary works in copyright. Also protection for diagrams, scientific, technical drawings, illustrations, tables, whatsoever. So a wide area of, of works that can be protected as literary works. We then, of course, can also have works from fine arts when we think of research papers, articles that may contain photographies. So somebody took photo photography and inserted it in a uh, research paper. This may be protected as a work of fine art. In digital environment where we also can have moving images, we talk about cinematographic works. and and that's also very important for, for science papers, for articles. We can also have collections or databases. So when we then have a research paper that's compiling also data and puts it together in a database, then also this database itself can be protected by copyright. The basic requirement for copyrights to subsist in this protected subject matter is that the elements uh, constitute an original intellectual creation. So what does this mean? This means that it needs to be original in whatever form. The courts usually interpret this uh, not very strict, which means they usually set a very low threshold of originality, which means everything is protected that somehow contains the personality of the author. Which means as soon as the author has some room for, for unfolding his creativity, which means that Another person who may con convey the same information might not do it in the same exact way. For example, when we write something down, then we have copyright protection. 
the European Court of Justice uh, stated that when we have press articles and we take some, some, some extracts out of press articles, we even may have copyright protection when we take 11 words. So when we think of written documents, as soon as we're talking about not only taking, taking specific single words, which are not protected, but longer sequences like a sentence or two sentences or a paragraph or whatsoever, as soon as there is a succession of 11 words, we regularly have copyright protection and so this uh, illustrates that we're very soon and very fast talking about uh, copyrights taking place in the scientific field. Now I want to address um, some potentials that uh, I perceive for uh, blockchain implemented solutions in the copyright sphere. Um, I've compiled a first list of, 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 of possibilities under the label of transparency. Of course, uh, we, we're often talking about transparency when we talk about blockchain technology. Uh, this is insofar interesting from a copyright perspective. As um, I already said, we have a very low threshold of copyright, so we have a lot of, 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 of protected subject matter in the digital environment. There's really, it must be, I don't know, some, some, some short tweets or something that's not protected as, as literary works, but as soon as we have some successions of words and, and phrases, that's usually protected. And copyright originates automatic, automatically through the creation of a protected work. So it does not require any registration or whatsoever. It's, it does not require that we put a copyright symbol next to it. So it's, it's originating automatically whether I want it or whether I want it not as an author. So that's the basic principle. And the ownership, that's the ownership issues that are resulting out of, this, uh, uh, out of this are that the authors are owning the copyright, which means the persons who are drafted, who created the copyright protected works. This of course can get very complicated when we think of joint authorship, because more usually than not nowadays people are, are working together, are co-jointly creating something, which means if, if a research paper, a scientific article is, 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 is written by uh, not one author but with many authors who are co-jointly writing on it then we have joint authorship with the results that all of the authors who contributed original intellectual creations are owning the copyright co-jointly co which means that whenever now they want to use their copyright and they want to allow uses to somebody else they need to read a mutual agreement so this, of course, can uh, raise very complex ownership issues. Also, when existing works are then now adapted or transfer, uh, transformed, edited, translated, whatsoever, then we also have the situation where we have multiple authorship. We have then the adapted, arranged work, where we have the copyright of both the original author as also his original work is still present in the adapted and the translated version. But we also have, if the translator, for example, also contributed an original intellectual creation by translating the work, then we have two copyrights in this edited uh, work. We have the original author who is still present in the work, and we have the translator, the editor, who is also owning copyright in this uh, translated form. We also have, uh, can have protection for compilation databases, I already mentioned that. And what's more, the, the complexity is further increased as we can also have neighboring rights, which are some protection rights uh, for other entities, like for example, uh, entities who are uh, producing photographs, move, moving pictures or databases. So we usually have a multiply of, of ownership issues and multiply of ownership in, in some protected subject matter. And what's further complicating the issues it's not always the authors that are uh, asserting their rights, that are making use of the copyright because they are usually or often granting usage rights to publishers, to collective management societies. So the, 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 the result of this is that we often have a situation where the information, who is actually entitled to, to use the work, to grant, to, grant user, to grant licenses to use the work, is, is, not, is not clear and is not uh, transparently um, stored on, in, in a database or whatsoever. We had some, some 
um, surveys where this was especially highlighted for online streaming services, the complexity of the, of the authorship issues, so they actually don't know where they can clear the rights for providing a streaming service. This can also hold true for, as I said, scientific uh, publishing, so when we only have uh, literary works, as we may have many, many contributors, which means that we may have a situation where the, the, the ownership issues are very unclear, we don't know who owns the rights, and this, of course, leads to transaction costs. Transaction costs means if I, as a user, want, now, want to, to use a work that, that is copyright protected, I, of course, have to identify all the rights holders that are involved in the works, and I have to contact them and arrange licensing solutions. So this can, of course, be very expensive or very, very um, difficult, and so a basic uh, provision of blockchain imp implemented solutions that we are discussing in literature is that it may uh, foster licensing solutions by lowering transaction costs. For example, by providing meta information on ownership in works and also by trusted timestamping for uh, transparently storing the ownership of rights in a specific version of documents. The problem, however, when we, when we think of storing uh, some information of ownership issues in a blockchain solution is the irre irrevocability of the, of, the, uh, of the solution because as we know if something is stored in the blockchain it's I'm not a technician so at least that's my, that's, that's my understanding it's not possible to change the previous blocks so um, we may have the, the problem that we have incorrect information stored in the blockchain on the ownership of a specific right which is then of course problematic as copyright protects the moral rights of the authors and one of the moral rights of the authors is the right to protect the authorship. So when, whenever somebody is contesting my authorship by stating that he or she owns the, author, the authorship in the work that I created, I can file an injunction against the infringer and I can also claim removal of this infringing information. And that's of course, I don't know how this can be facilitated in a blockchain environment if we have some incorrect information about the ownership issues stored in a block and then somebody who is the actual author, the real author, files an injunction and a claim for removal of this uh, false information. It's general in my perception that the, the problem when we talk about storing data in blockchain because uh, we also dealt with these issues in our research project in, in Krems. We have kind of various IP rights in data. We usually think of, of, of data as something that's not protected, but as I said, we're very easily in an area where, the, where also data can be protected. When we have like text snippets that are longer than 11 words, or when the, the, the pictures in it, or when we talk about maybe a patent law, when we think of 3D printing files, when we talk about trade secrets, what uh, maybe when we talk about compilations of data, so there are various IP rights which can be which can be involved when we when we just uh, talk about storing data, store and, and storing data in solutions that are not revocable, which is then of course very problematic in terms of uh, complying with court orders that are. Uh, that, that are ordering me to remove false or infringing information or content from the blockchain. Another issue that we um, addressed in, in our research project that's uh, very technical from a law perspective, uh, we think a big potential of the uh, blockchain uh, solutions can also uh, lie in transparency of, of, uh, of um, license terms. Because when we have a negotiation process, like for example, uh, we have an author or a publisher who is negotiating license terms with, with a potential user, we often have some unclear license terms. That's, you know, when, when, especially when lawyers are involved, we are very good at detecting unclear uh, terms and in detecting unclearities. So, one principle of solving unclear license terms is that the general civil law says that in bilateral contracts, so when two parties are uh, negotiating a contract, 
an unclear statement is interpreted to the detriment of the person who has used it. So the person who used an unclear term in a ne negotiation process then has the disadvantage that the unclear term is interpreted to his detriment. So in blockchain solutions this of course can be uh, it can be interesting that the, the, the drafting and negotiation process can be transparently uh, stored because then we know okay who actually uh, is responsible for inserting which license terms into the negotiation process and we can then uh, take this into the consideration of, um, of uh, interpreting the, the, the unclear license terms. Another important aspect that the blockchain can contribute uh, in terms of copyright, of, co of course, uh, fostering compliance. Compliance with, with licensing solutions, we have the exclusive rights of, of the author, we have the right of reproduction, right of distribution, which are at the center of, of, of granting licenses, of making works available, of putting uh, works into, dis into dissemination and maybe uh, earn uh, monetary rewards uh, as a return and we also have the making available right in the digital sphere which are then the, ba the, 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 the basic principles for granting usage rights in terms of licenses these are usually secured by legal remedies, I already mentioned them and these are usually secured or sometimes secured by digital rights management technologies which means copyright, uh, copy protection mechanisms as we know it from physical objects like CDs or DVDs However, the problem, of course, is these factual uh, copy protection mechanisms can be circumvented and also in terms of, of enforcement, we have the, uh, the problem that it's very hard to detect infringements in, digital, in, digi in the digital environment. The cost of monitoring uses are usually very high and, of course, enforcement, legal enforcement in an anonymous environment is usually uh, very problematic, so blockchain may contribute here by providing watermark, digital fingerprints of works, and therefore foster license solutions. May I um, yep. uh, interrupt you here a little bit? I think everyone here in the in the room knows that, um, like, not from a legal point of view, but like in general, that uh, smart contracts, blockchain-based smart contracts, are a DRM tool. For us, the question is relevant uh, in scientific publishing. Um, we have a lot of intransparencies, uh, we have a lot of middlemen mm -hmm. uh, that are benefiting from the works that are being produced, that, that are being produced by scientists who are being paid by the state, uh, yet uh, uh, other people, um, uh, the people who are paying, the taxpayers do yeah. not have access to this. So I think for us really the biggest, biggest question is uh, what are the legal interpretations in that field? And, and uh, because uh, unfortunately you were not here in the morning, but we have a lot of startups that are working on solutions to make the processes more transparent, more collaborative, more decentralized. Um, and the legal aspects of these things would be uh, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the publishers. If we talk about peer-to-peer -peer publishing, the yeah. focus of peer-to-peer -peer publishing. Yeah. Um, where do you see the greatest potentials, but also the greatest challenges? When you talk from a copyright perspective, you have the author, maybe you may have joint authors, they are the owners of the copyright, and they cannot choose to, 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 to grant licenses. They may choose to publish the work open access, which means granting licenses to third parties with maybe some, some license terms for providing reference, or they may choose a publisher to do that for them, and then they grant licenses to publishers. So this is, this is the core principle from copyright. There are no peer reviewers or whatsoever. They are not involved in terms of copyright. We have either authors who are taking the open access view and grant like Creative Commons licenses, or you may choose to get, go to a publisher and grant an exclusive uh, license to a publisher. And then the publisher is making use of the license and granting user rights to other entities. What would be in a more complex case? Because uh, uh, smart contracts, uh, decentralized uh, uh, and, and token-based decentralized autonomous organizations would allow collaborative ways of publishing where the publisher is the code in the end. Um, and then you don't have one legal entity that is a publisher, but you have, um, yes, maybe we open it to discussion with those people who are working on solutions. 
Um, I think the more complex part is when we actually get rid of uh, uh, with the solutions where we don't need traditional publishing houses less and less yeah. and we have t token based incentive systems and, and swarm review uh, where the uh, current um, um, uh, borders are not clear anymore. Do you, maybe some other questions from you guys? Yeah, so uh, one way of s addressing that is to transfer the copyright to the, the body that is governed but there are differences like between European copyright law and UK, uh, particularly with the moral rights and the author. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I, I've, my specific question would be, because uh, I'd, I'd really like to hear your knowledge on this, is, um, for instance, if I'm a copyright holder and I sign a contract um, and these are in conflict, like say the contract says, I will not publish this for three months or six months. We don't do this under contract. Uh, with the, let's say uh, us in this room or with you, right? Okay. We, we yeah, co-authors. With co-authors or with the publisher, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say the DAO is the publisher, and the DAO wants to exploit the information for three months, right? But I'm the copyright holder. So rather than having to transfer the copyright, I might sign a contract saying I will allow, uh, I will not publish for three months. Yeah. Um, where, what are the restrictions or scope there between, you know? my rights and copyright and now the contractual rights and the moral author there or is this too complicated do you simply have to transfer the copyright over to be able to do anything sophisticated in the blockchain space for instance do you have another comment or question maybe we we collect this yeah, very quickly um before i had the blockchain uh, my strategy was copyright so if we don't want to talk about this um, in common law i think i can talk to you about the whole thing and what i'm seeing this this is the antithesis or the opposite of what blockchain is trying to do. As researchers, we're not trying to stop people from accessing our exactly. rights. We want them to. It's the publishers are getting in the way. And what, what people want is attribution of the fact that their ideas are being taken. So I that think would have been my next point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think you started off on the wrong foot, that was all. Okay, um, shall we now do the discussion or shall we finish? The... No, no, let's, let's do the attribution. Okay. So, my next point would have been, I talk now about commercial exploitation, but it's also important, copyright and also blockchain solutions can be important in open science relation, because we usually, we, we often talk about when we think of open science, copyright is hindering, uh, maybe innovation, but to my point of view, that's not the case, because we copyright, we have not only copyright that's protecting commercial interests, but also moral interests, and when we talk about open science, moral interests are at the very center of, 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 of publishing and of incentives. For example, when you think of the right of attribution, we here have this living document, which you of course know, and this requires me to give appropriate reference to the authors. So what does this mean? If I now want to cite this document in terms of copyright, I have to cite every author who contributed more than 11 words. I do not have to cite the people who just provided some, some, some remarks or did some editing or some changed change the color in the text or whatever, but I need to cite all of them who contributed more than 11 words. That's also required by the citation right. So in, in, also in such open science issues, it would be very helpful for me to have like a proof who are the authors of this document and especially who are the authors of the document in the current specific version because if I'm citing this paper today I need to have little certainty because if, if I have tomorrow three other and three new right holders who have contributed so that I can prove I cited the persons who were the right owners when I cited this, 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 this document and do not infringe the, the, the right of somebody who contributed after I used the right. So, it's also in an open science environment where we have uh, copyright issues to uh, take into consideration. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm over my time now because of the discussion. I, I have some, some other issues with, with, with libraries, but I think the, the, the interest is more in another direction. So. Maybe we open it, collect a few yeah. questions, because uh, I think there are some legal questions. Unfortunately, some of the startups. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, open. Like, like maybe we ask the startups how they or the projects how they how how they want to solve the copyright solution. Or I mean, now is the right moment to ask. Yeah. Uh, do you rely on CC BY or do you haven't thought about it yet? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you when you're using CC BY for this blockchain publishing platform, then you're yeah. good, right? Yeah, but uh, if I use it, then of course I have to cite the the, the, the right author. The, the yeah. Right okay. Author. Okay. So and if it's like wrongly attributed in some blockchain, then you can't change it, right? You can't change it, and yeah. if I wrongly uh, wrongly cite them, then I'm liable. So okay. You have these injunctions ah. which are totally irrevocable, uh, independent of negligence. Yeah. So, if I have like a document that says, well, um, you need to cite this and this author, and then I cite it in the way, but actually I then encounter that somebody other, some, some a third party wrote it and is the real author, then I'm also liable for copyright infringement. Okay, is there a way around that? Yeah. Like a trick or some no. legal trick, or so that somebody <laughs> who like in best intention like. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm in good faith, if I'm acting in yeah, good yeah, faith, yeah. I'm not liable for damages. Okay. So if somebody then claims damages from me, then I'm in good faith, I don't have to pay damages. But anybody can force me to uh, take like an infringing copy down. And if I have, a, if I have, made, if I have read a, a, a document and I cited somebody wrong, whether I'm, I'm responsible or not, he can claim like an injunction, which means I uh, must refrain from doing it in the future, and uh, also must to, to, to correct this, this this wrong information okay. as so far as it's possible. Blockchain doesn't mean that it's a mutual in that sense. Yes. It's just yeah. like you've got a pile of claims, um, yeah. of copyright claims, and you've got an audit trail. So you can revert, you can say at this time in history, uh, it was claimed that I was the copyright holder, but later on we found, and you just make a link between those, so you, just because you're using an immutable yeah. data structure doesn't mean you're using an immutable legal structure. Yeah. yeah. So just on that injunction, can you give us one example where someone's actually gone to court? Mm -hmm. Not for this, but for this particular thing. I don't have examples in the legal. Uh, in exactly. The, in the, in the I, don't, I don't think they, the only ones that I know where, is where there's been a publisher involved, but normally when you publish something, the only times I've heard of anyone going to court is being for defamation, which is a separate issue. I mean, this is all, sorry, but with all due respect, this isn't theory. This is what could happen, but it never happens. Are you willing to take the risk? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got to look at your okay. chances of getting caught. Sorry? We look at our chances of getting caught. I'm sure everyone in this room has gone over the speed limit at some point yeah. um, and thought, I'm not going to get caught. Yeah. Okay, if you're willing to take the risk, yeah. I mean, if the, if the, if the university, the, the VU is willing to take the risk to say we have a repository and we're putting stuff up there, there is, there is liability. But every university does that. <laughs> yeah, but they also have to, have to face the risks if some, something went wrong. Yeah, but they won't. All that, that will happen is that they'll say, look, I mean, it hasn't happened. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You can't cite an example because I don't know an example. I wouldn't know an example of this happened. Yeah, okay, if you, if you say, well, I'm willing to take all the risks, then uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the legal situation. Yeah, but it's legal and it's real life. Yeah, but <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's, well, I think I that's think your I decision to take then. Can I, can I ask a question? We have, for example, here two guys who are building Science Route, and you gave your presentation before. Um, so when you are building your, uh, your platform um, or your solution, when it comes to copyright issues, etc., do you have um, are you do you have experts you work with to code uh, the law existing laws into your solutions, or are you building uh, how how are you conducting the design of your system? We don't have experts at the moment. We plan also to see as we go. Okay. <laughs> so I think the big... Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I, 
So what I think the that? big potential, correct me if I'm wrong, and it's basically what you've been saying, is that we have existing copyright laws. And smart contracts or this technology allows us to embed uh, enforcement or, or embed these rules into a smart contract, which has uh, uh, the, the advantage that is also auto-enforceable and then I don't have to think about who I cite. It will be conducted automatically in yeah. compliance and everything happens on the fly. And if lawyers work together with software developers, this, is, this would be perfect because I think, and this is why we invited you, there is a body of knowledge and there is actually real life and law, right? that you need to know this, uh, um, uh, the, the reality of existing laws and, and design uh, according to this. Uh, where I see the challenge, and please uh, could you elaborate on this, is that we live in a world of national legal silos. And I see the problems much more in that, and maybe you could answer Yeah, that's true, questions. we don't have an international copyright, so... Yet blockchain is like kind of as the next generation internet, or as the driver in the next generation internet in the decentralized web. Um, it's like uh, which law applies in a peer-to-peer -peer network of actors, you know, where you don't have a server. Yes. And um, how can we consolidate or can we consolidate at all because startups want to build things now before there is legal certainty, right? And you, you're, you're like, your role is to say like what could happen in the worst case scenario and this is the discussion that we're having right now. So are there any practical tips that you can give like building a decentralized system that should be applicable in all jurisdictions? Is there the possibility at all or what should we focus on? Currently, we, we don't have an international, or not even European, harmonized copyright law. We have eight, 28 uh, different copyright systems in the European Union, which are harmonized to a certain level. But of course, if I'm now making a, a work available on the internet, which means I put something on the internet and that's available on a worldwide basis, I may infringe the copyright in every, in every country where the work can be downloaded. Which means I actually, if I make something available on a worldwide base, have to comply with all of the copyrights in all countries where the works can be downloaded. That's the reason why we have geoblocking. We have some, 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 some geographical restrictions for making it available only in specific, in, in specific uh, countries, for example. I actually wanted to talk about uh, maybe some fields of, of, of copyright law where the technology may come in. So, of course, you may, may say this is actually only of theoretical nature, but that's the law. Yeah. That's why I'm trying to get away from law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, it's, it's, it's not, in my point of view, it's not advisable to just build like, yeah. like a technological environment that's, that, that doesn't care about the law itself. YouTube did it as well. And now they're changing the European copyright law that YouTube becomes compliant. So, but my, sorry, but my point is that People aren't wanting to use the law in the way that it was traditionally used. They want them to do it differently. So it's not people say, oh, I want to stop people from using it. I want to ma facilitate people to use it. So it's completely yeah. different. And but that's why this is the example of Creative Commons. Yeah. It's not even enforceable. This is like a, like a, a, a contract that's just yeah. made on good faith. So like uh, good moral rights, uh, you can completely undermine Creative Commons. I'm publishing Creative Commons. But if someone, like, uh, like I've published my artworks in Creative Commons, but if someone uses my artwork in a context that I disagree with and it's against the context of that artwork, I can take it to uh, court over infringement of moral rights. This happens a lot with art. It happens a lot with art. I don't know so much about academic papers. But like, even though it's published in Creative Commons and you can have like, sort of free to use, reuse as well, and uh, uh, you can still uh, undermine that Creative Commons for sure. with the legal framework of the country that you were publishing easy. So, Creative Commons doesn't even solve these problems. It's just some good faith, and this kind of it's, is how you go ahead with things. It's not just good faith. Just because there are exceptions and there may be a odd hat in certain jurisdictions doesn't mean the work by hundreds of lawyers in multiple jurisdictions over many years of um, addressing exactly the issues you're talking about. So there is already an organisation we can leverage uh, that has young lawyers in multiple jurisdictions in copyright around the world who've been through this process already 
And just because there's the odd exception doesn't mean that that is an incredibly valuable tool for the community to use. Well, I, I mean, by saying that it's an odd exception is you can't automatically enforce these things with smart contracts, which is sort of, uh, like, because there's this odd exception. Forget the autom yeah. Yeah. automatic enforcement. Exactly. It's augmented enforcement. Okay, so um, to sum it up, um, you wanted to, to bring examples of where we can use? I address these issues yeah. where we as lawyers are talking about blockchain solutions. So where we can maybe have technical solutions that are, and that's not about, not, not all of this is about like hindering users. I mean, you, you talk about if, 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 if copyright law, if the law is just about hindering, hindering users, that's not the case at all. I mean, it's just about, it's actually about creating the right incentives for making users because when we talk about moral rights, there has to be a citation right. When, when, also when you talk about open science, because if I'm an author in an open science environment and anybody can just use my article without citing me, even if I say, okay, I don't want remuneration, but at least I have to be cited as the author and I don't want anybody else who, who, who says he's the author of the, of the work. I mean, the, the, the whole discussion about like abolishing copyright and we don't need to restrict copyright, of course, in certain aspects, but it's not the fundamental idea that's wrong. I don't think Good. the question is abolishing copyright. The question is what are the challenges? Yeah. One of them, I think, are the multiple jurisdictions. Multiple jurisdictions? Yeah. Citing the right authors that I need to cite. But Complying with the license terms that a work may be under. Complexity of, of ownership in works. But citing the right authors, if you embed this in the code, this can be automatically done. Exactly, that's what, yes. what I wanted to, to suggest. Actually. Yes, and, 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 um, and, um, and, um, and the, but the biggest problem that we cannot solve is the multiple jurisdiction problem. You were talking about IP blocking in yeah. the decentralized web. Once we have maybe IPFS, like really up and running and functioning, uh, IP blocking will, well maybe there will be new ways of IP blocking, but uh, that w might be a challenge, geo-blocking. Yeah. As, as soon as we have no, no harmonization, as, as long as we don't have harmonization, I always will have the difficulty, if I make something available and it's available in a, in a specific country where this is not covered by an exception or by, if the, the license is not applied there, or if the license is interpreted differently there, than the other country, then I have a problem. Because we have the principle of territoriality in copyright law. We are harmonizing, we're about to harmonize it in the European Union, but there are a lot of, 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 difficult, of differences between the member states, so we, we, we are not very far in terms of harmonizing, but at the international level, we are very, very far from really reach and, and, and harmonized copyright level. And then they're in blockchain or crypto, uh, crypto cloud or like really distributed system, there's no way to like localize stuff and content, right? I mean, the, localizing in terms of restricting yeah. access to it, then I only, only have to be compliant in the countries where it's access, accessible. But I cannot say I'm only subject to the Austrian copyright law and make it available on the, on the, on the internet so that it's, it's, can, it can be found in the we haven't since like the origins of scholarship. Yeah. Okay. Most we have citations. We're doing it 300 years before the I think. Okay. Yes. So the question is when and where researchers would like to provide open access. Does that in any way, shape, or form infringe existing laws? We have, for the first time, have the technology where we have so low transaction costs where we can make compliance and enforcement of <coughs> rights management happen at very low costs where we, in the future, might not need traditional publishers. Um, so, maybe two more questions? Yes? Yeah, would it maybe be possible to, to create a copyright exactly for blockchain technologies, for, for open science? And yeah. You have a special license exactly for this purpose. You can, of course you can yeah. draft. Of course you can. <laughs> yeah. Of course you can yeah. draft a, a, a special license specifically for for using academic works. But you still have the problem if you make it available on the internet. 
you don't know how the, the Spanish copyright law is interpreting this license or how the Spanish copyright law, I mean, or maybe the, 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 the Brazilian copyright law is, is, is drafted. If this license is, how is interpreted there, what exceptions do they have? I mean, we have exceptions for libraries, we have exceptions for teaching uses, for private copying, but there are well, totally for different me, as a circumstances. Person, I don't care how it's interpreted in, in Spain. Yeah. Then uh, I don't care. Then hope the that only also who cares is a publisher yeah. who has much, uh, 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 how to say, any, right. who has lots of money, who has lots of lawyers. Yeah. He cares about the Spanish right. I don't care. Yeah. If I provide it to the blockchain and say, okay, use it if you want, then I'm fine. Yeah. I just say, what if, what if, what if you incorporate <laughs> some? What's a disciplinary no, research what in university? Yeah. They care a lot about it, yeah. unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. What if you incorporated something into your work that you're actually not allowed to do under the Brazilian copyright law? And that's mm -hmm. that's not the publisher. That's not the publisher. Yeah. But you took my photograph, and under Brazilian copyright law, you are not allowed to cite my photograph. So I claim an infringement under Brazilian copyright law because you infringe my copyright in Brazilian. In the Brazilian country. Okay, we have. You've been trying to say something for yeah, the time. Yeah, just have a comment since when is um, citing um, subject to copyright? I mean, this is always been cite, citation has always been subject to um, good scientific practice, right? So why why are we all of a sudden mixing this up to my? What are we mixing up? Good scientific practice yeah. and copyright. Uh, I mean, if I don't cite anything, yeah. one, this is a, a subject to. Not really that's copyright. If you, if, you, if you take my photograph into your paper without citing me as the author of the photograph, you're infringing my copyright. That's also... That's also... Yeah, yeah. I think the blockchain is even more easier to there are two aspects of sight. Okay, maybe, I think there is a comment that would resolve it. I think the problem you have addressed is already in the place and so it's the two sides. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with that aim and that objective. So I, I'm, the two startups I'm working with in open access publishing, right, want to publish everything into the commons, right? So that's the complete objective, complete open access, publishing of knowledge into the commons. However, if you need to finance that publishing process, 
in competition with Elsevier or these other things. You have to look at business models that make sense of that. So that you can pay maybe the editors and, and the, the peer reviewers and uh, do a really good job of that publishing. So by looking at copyright law and being clever about it, you can do things like say for three months, this use can happen and then it must buy smart contract to be published like this. Or you can do all sorts of interesting things that work with the incentives. So that's where blockchain and copyright law meet. I think very often, and <coughs> I'm sorry, I think uh, there is, we have a problem of vocabulary. And we see no. it in our uh, research institute, where we're trying to do it, and uh, Martin Binner is part of it. It's like when certain terms that we, we use in the software development space uh, are very differently interpreted just um, in, 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 in the legal yeah. uh, realm. Yeah. And I think the greatest challenge that we really have is first to have the same language, and also the approach uh, 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 the traditional legal approach is to protect your downside and, uh, um, and software developers are working on solutions to, to create a better um, um, uh, creating new solutions and um, I was hoping that and, and, and this shows the necessity to maybe have a conference just on that topic where we can go in depth uh, because it's a complex issue and we need to face the fact that we live in a world of multiple jurisdictions mm -hmm. with very highly complex uh, copyrights and, um, and uh, that will not go away uh, um, instantly. And if we're talking about token-based incentive models, what you just said is very important because we want to start earning money with attributions, micro-attributions. Oh. We're not here in the morning, so what, what you were presenting is very, very important. Uh, what what we need is wiggle room because we want to build decentralized applications that are unstoppable, that are uh, multi-jurisdictional, and we need more help from uh, legal scholars who understand where the potential loopholes or new ways of interpretation are. Uh, apart from the classic, you know, you can, uh, building uh, laws into a smart contract is quite easy once you sit, sit down together with a software developer. The challenging part is how to change common practice. And um, I, I think it should be a whole conference, so unfortunately we have to end this at this point. Thank you for coming, in spite of the By the by, one or some of the projects, right? You're available for them, maybe to I consult know. them. Or yeah, I just have to, to leave at half past. No, I know, I know. I mean, like yeah, long midterm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Because you're a lawyer who understands open science and blockchain and copyright, that is not very often. Right? Thank you, thank you, Doc. Okay. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. Georg Fessler, he is uh, working at the library uh, here at the Wirtschaftsuniversität <laughs> Vienna and he will be talking from a practical experience um, um, the daily issues with uh, buy-in publications, right? Yes, uh, thank you for this introduction and for the invitation to give some uh, views from the library perspective. Um, yes, my name is George Fessler, I'm putting a degree in economics and I'm working for more than 20 years now in the field of information services and, and libraries. Um, this is my working place, working place is uh, my office in this, this, in this building. We are very proud that we have uh, this uh, facility building from Saladit uh, uh, as a library building, it's called the Library Learning Center. Um, and the library is in the center of the campus, in the center of this building. And it's a great pleasure to have such an environment uh, to, to, uh, to provide the uh, library services. Um, okay, blockchain. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not an expert uh, uh, in blockchain. I've uh, discussed with Alfred Orde some, uh, some aspects of blockchain. 
um, uh, I've learned today uh, a lot, uh, uh, but I will concentrate uh, on, on, on issues of uh, hot topics in, in the library, in the library community. Uh, we already discussed uh, uh, open access, uh, but I will not uh, tell you a lot about uh, uh, blockchain. So what are my topics? Uh, a short uh, uh, overview and insight, what does a modern library do in the time of the internet and in the time of electronic resources? Then I would like to emphasize on uh, the most important communication tool in science, it's, it's called the journal system. And at the end, uh, we will tell a little bit about technologies and IT systems in libraries, but also have questions to the uh, blockchain community what, where there are uh, possibilities to work together. Um, yes, everything is electronically. Uh, the internet is in place, so what are the libraries doing at these times? Uh, First, uh, the library is still uh, a place, a place to learn, a place to study. Uh, we have a building with more than 1,500 places in the morning. The students are rushing in and the evening at 10 o'clock the students are rushing out. So there is a need, uh, there is a need uh, for a place uh, to learn, to study and to, to, to collaborate together. Um, the second thing is, as 400 of years, uh, libraries are collecting and providing uh, content and uh, obviously we have now uh, more electronic content and printed content. We have already uh, more than 70% of our budget spending uh, for electronic formats, but uh, the, the, this amount is not uh, only spent for journals or journal articles for uh, 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 this kind of publishers. We have a lot of uh, electronic uh, uh, offerings and financial databases and uh, data that we are providing in databases. So uh, we have a broad range of uh, collections and, and, and media that we are providing. But most important, the modern library is a service organization. So forget the old-fashioned uh, image of the library as a gatekeeper or a middleman. Uh, we have uh, we are a modern organization with serve with a service orientation, and we are supporting the main processes of a university, and the main processes are learning, teaching, and research. So all the uh, search engines, all the uh, workshops, all the e-learning systems we are providing, uh, all the support, or our open access activities are in support of our organizations and of our users. Um, that are uh, here in, at this university. Um, okay, um, let's come to the uh, scholarly publishing system. What is the main problem? We've discussed it uh, already uh, in the morning. We have a very uh, high uh, market concentration in the, in the market for uh, journal publishing. <coughs> Uh, when you see, when you look at the left side of this graph, uh, you should see that in the 70s, only 15% 15, 15 of the articles were published by the five major publishers in this time. Uh, uh, when we look further to the uh, year 2013, so 40, 50 uh, years later, uh, nearly 60 to 70 percent of all articles that are published in social, social sciences and in, uh, in, uh, in humanities are published by five publishers. You know the names of the publishers. Uh, it's Elsevier, Springer, Nature. They merged some years ago. It's Wiley, Terran, Francis, and Sage. So these are the major players in the field of electronic publishing for the journals. Uh, you see here the graph for social sciences and humanities, but uh, there's a similar development for natural sciences and life sciences, uh, even worse. The concentration is very, uh, very huge. Uh, the concentration in the market for uh, scholarly publishing is not just uh, with the journals and not just with the books and e-books. Uh, when you look, for example, for uh, at the Elsevier, Elsevier is a huge platform where all the e-books and all the journals are provided science, science direct. 
uh, but they have a lot of other services and tools and providing them to the research institutions and the, to the universities. Uh, Scopus is a database where you can search for all the uh, publications of all pu publishers and have also uh, competing uh, metrics to, to, to the impact factor. They are, they are developing new metrics for evaluation, uh, evaluating uh, 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 the diplomatic field. Cyber is a tool that they are providing for institutions, for the management of ins uh, institutions and the management of universities to evaluate uh, researchers, to evaluate institutes, to evaluate uh, the whole university co compared to other universities. They are providing another tool called Pure. I think someone mentioned it already in the, in the, in the morning. Uh, it's a, a current research information system where the university can collect all the publications and all the projects they are doing. Uh, they uh, acquired uh, Plum, Plum X was an alternative metrics system and now Plum Analytics. And uh, uh, this uh, not just development, but also acquisitions of other companies that. Uh, developed uh, specific things. Mendeley was an independent uh, research, uh, 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 independent, how do you say, <coughs> preference manager system and collaborating system and uh, uh, it's all already owned by LCD. SSRN and PPRESS are uh, open access publishers, independent open access publishers that were acquired by Elsevier, I think two years ago, I've bench is uh, uh, for, for labs, uh, notebooks for labs. So it's not just uh, in, the, in the market for uh, uh, journals and articles, but uh, what they, the big players in, in scholarly publishing are trying to do is to uh, cover the whole life cycle of research uh, with several tools and the, the, the tools uh, are integrated in, into each other. There are interfaces between them when you own for the license already to sign started with Scopus or Cywell. It's easy to be pulled in into the system and into this ecosystem and uh, you, it's not easy to get out. So why are these uh, publishers, these five major publishers, are so uh, strong and have so much power. It's the market structure that is common in other industries as well, information industry, technology industries, we have fixed uh, uh, costs and very low marginal costs. We have, uh, we have economies of scale in place. We have strong, strong network effects and, and lock-in effects. So uh, there is uh, a tendency in this market as it is with uh, social networks, with telecommunication industry and other industries, that there is a monopolization or uh, oligopolistic market structure. But <coughs> in the uh, scholarly uh, research system, there is an additional very strong force that is giving the publishers uh, more, much more power, and this is the incentive system uh, in place in the universities. Uh, this is a paper published some years ago from uh, in the Economic Inquiry Journal, it's a journal from Wiley, um, and they asked the established economists uh, what they're willing to give up, uh, what they're willing to sacrifice for immediate uh, uh, article published in the American Economic Review, one of the most prestigious, prestigious uh, 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 journals in the field of economics. So they are not willing to uh, give up their right arm, but the, the result of this research was uh, that they are willing to give more than half of their time. Uh, when without cheating, they can have uh, an immediate uh, publication in this journal and other journals which are uh, high rated. And I think this is uh, very important uh, to discuss when we are talking about disrupting the publishing system because um, we had we heard in the, in the morning that there are uh, initiatives, for example, to pay the authors for their content. But this uh, research gives them a hint that it's not that they want to be paid. They are even uh, uh, prepared to sacrifice their health uh, because they get something for it. Uh, they get no financial reward, uh, 
but we get uh, cap, uh, social capital, a lot of social capital when publishing in high-ranking journals. And this incentive structure is the reason why uh, these uh, big publishers are in place and why it's so difficult to change the system. It's on the personal level that the authors are forced uh, to publish these journals because um, they want to get a job promotion and a better career in their field. Uh, it's on an institutional level that the institute is uh, evaluated by their publications in hiring journals. And also for the university, it's better to have uh, publications of their researchers in these uh, journals because when you're talking to the minister about money, it's better to have a good ranking and to not dropping down in the ranking of international comparisons of universities. So I think uh, uh, there are technical uh, points like blockchain and so but you, you have also to be aware that there, there are social, economic uh, uh, and, and incentive uh, issues to, to address when you want to disrupt the system. What is the system? What, what are the business models that are now in place? Uh, uh, when you look on the timeline, we began in the 90s uh, with single print subscription. There was a print subscription to one single journal that was ordinary in the 90s. Um, uh, then began uh, with the beginning of the internet, uh, there were the combined print and electronic subscriptions available and uh, libraries subscribed to. Uh, the electronic format uh, made it possible that the publishers uh, could uh, bundle journals to, uh, uh, to packages, the subject uh, packages or other packages, the whole uh, publish publication output of, an, uh, uh, of a publisher, for example. Uh, also in the 2000s, uh, the libraries began to cooperate and to, uh, to join together to build up uh, national, national consortiums to negotiate with the publishers together. And uh, this is the term that is often discussed as a big deal, so they are national-wide uh, 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 contracts with the publishers where I would say uh, the advantage of this national uh, consortium are that the content that is available for the institutions in this closed system is much more and the, uh, the, the payment was increased not so, so much. In the last years we began to uh, uh, discuss with the publishers not just the reading side, getting access to the subscribe journals, but also publishing, so there are now uh, in Austria, for example, read and publish these in place with uh, four of the five uh, big publishers. Uh, read and publish uh, means that you can read all the journals of the publisher and all the, all the researchers of the universities can uh, publish uh, without uh, additional costs open access in these journals. Um, parallel to this the development on the left side, uh, there is the, uh, uh, the evolving uh, open access um, world with several uh, uh, business models in place. Um, began with self archiving and repositories, you know, this is uh, very good. And there are non commercial ways to open access where the co costs are covered by institutions or by, by member fees or by the societies. And there is the commercial side uh, of open access, so the big uh, publishers also uh, implemented business, business models where they uh, are offering, uh, when someone wants to publish open access, either by article processing charges, so paying for each article uh, to be published and there's no subscription fee and the, the access is uh, free for all, or with the big deals that are already uh, um, you can imagine that in the open access uh, uh, movement there are big discussions and intense discussions which way is the best to, to open up the system and to, to come further <coughs> uh, to, to an open access world. And all these discussions are under the impression of uh, private sharing uh, from the researchers and uh, piracy platforms like SIA, uh, and uh, you can imagine that the publishers are monitoring this development very 
very closely and already had uh, some acts, uh, legal acts or also technical acts uh, in place to, uh, to, 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 to try to, 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 to put this away. Um, it's not the time now here to discuss the, uh, the details of, of privacy and uh, piracy and, and sharing, but what you have to say, it's not, not, a, sustainable, uh, it's not a sustainable business model. Um, uh, but uh, yes, maybe we can discuss it in the, uh, after this, uh, this speech. Um, when you want to disrupt the system, and when you want to build up a new publishing system and publisher, uh, you have to be aware that it's not just about sending the text from the author to the, to the reader. Uh, the, the, the big publishers are in place because they're doing some things uh, good. They do the registration. Uh, uh, and you, when you want to disrupt the system, you have also to do this. Uh, you have to meet these minimum requirements. Uh, to be successful. So the registration function of, of publishing systems is uh, who was the first with this idea. Uh, uh, it's like in a patent system. The certification was the research done properly. It is usually done by peer review or when you have a strong brand name, there are subject fields where peer reviews are not uh, common like the law or uh, subject, uh, the law departments. Then you have a strong brain, for example, or editorial board uh, where, you, where, where you can do the certification. The dissemination is important. Uh, the author and the reader wants to uh, have uh, a good dissemination, dissemination system, an electronic dissemination system with powerful platforms, with metadata, with search engine optimization, usage statistics, and so on. And uh, this was also mentioned in the morning, uh, there is the function of I think, so you want to be sure that an article that you have published will be still uh, available in 10 or 20 years, and uh, you have to build up a system that is, uh, uh, at minimum, uh, does uh, meet these requirements. It has to be quick, this, the work flows uh, have to be very smooth, that, that, that your system is accepted, and it should be inexpensive, not that expensive, but it's uh, with the big publishers. Um, yes, this was my point of uh, view and my perspective of, uh, for the, for the uh, scholarly publishing system, especially for the, uh, for the, for the journal system. Um, one slide to the uh, topic systems and technologies in the library. The library is not just uh, buying a subscription of journals <coughs> and, and giving uh, you access or doing access stuff. There are a lot of uh, technologies and systems <coughs> in, the, in the library in operation. I don't want to, uh, to, to mention all of them. And when I prepared for this speech and uh, uh, thought about uh, blockchain and so on, uh, uh, I was wondering uh, which of these tools do you want to uh, replace with blockchain? So it's also a feedback, for example, uh, from me, from the, to the blockchain community, um, where, the, where the saying is, we want to disrupt the system, we want to uh, 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 replace all the techno technology that is in place. Uh, it's the new internet. So the question, my question is, which of these tools uh, can, be can be replaced by uh, blockchain technology? Uh, is it another tool that we are also using for specific uh, uh, um, functions? Is it a tool in the, uh, where the user is confronted with? Is it a, is it a tool that uh, is in the, in the front, in the back end of the system? So this would be my questions to you. Uh, what, what do you think that library and, and, and libraries and library technology and uh, blockchain are connecting? Yes, um, I'm looking forward for your comments and the discussion. Thank you for your attention. I have a question for you. To get an idea of, do you have any metrics on what you spend on journals annually? 
what we are spending yeah. on journals. Is there a metric that you could apply generally, such as per student? <laughs> um, I cannot disclose oh, okay, the, 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 the figures. What we are doing regularly with all electronic uh, uh, sources, we're doing cost per, per downloads and cost per <laughs> use uh, uh, analysis and looking whether the, that what we are spending for these uh, uh, resources or for whether they are all, all also used and yeah. what, is, uh, what this figure is. Um, I don't know why at this university we have a very huge uh, usage of all electronic uh, resources and the figures are good. That's what I, what I can say. Can you give percentages or proportions? Rather than absolute numbers? Um, with this cost per downloads, uh, for example. Well, when, uh, not cost. Oh, yeah. Maybe cost per uh, there, there, there are figures when, when you pay beyond one euro per cost per download, it's a very good figure. And uh, we know in the consortia a little bit uh, how to use to choose with other, um, with other universities. So I have no bad feeling about these expansions because the, the resources are uh, used very heavily. Because it was more in terms of um, finding the market price for blockchain, if you were going to charge a university. I think the problem is that it, it's very difficult to find a market price for the electronic products at all. So because the marginal costs are zero, so uh, there's price differentiation in this market. So yeah. they are selling the same product to a small university or the Fachhochschule, very with to the university very expensive. What is the <coughs> price for it, for a for a electronic product? They have to, uh, product. They have to cover the <coughs> costs. That's the one. Yeah. They want to make profit to, to make a lot of profit. But the individual price for one institution or for one user for electronic uh, uh, product or for other products like flights or so are uh, uh, differentiating uh, very broad, and it's it's not easy to find the the the, the, the the right price. It's often a question whether willing, what are you willing to pay and what is the institution, what can the institution pay for such a specific content? Um, I, I have a question. The university is a public institution. Yeah. Why is it not transparent how much the library is spending on certain resources? Um, it's, how is that? Anyway? It's transparent. The reserves cost in the library statistics where it's transparent for the for their whole budget, and which how it is split it up for journals and electronic resources and, and, and books and so on, <coughs> but not for, for specific publishers. Uh, it doesn't need to go down not to specific, that. but it's all journals overall. in general. How much is the library, uh, the VU library, spending yeah. on all journals, electronic or in print? Uh, not books. Uh, we have not uh, acquisition still. budget of around. 3 million euros, and the thing we are spending 7 800,000 for journals, and print, and electronic. Thank you. Okay. But as I said, uh, this, is, this is interesting for the open access discussion. Uh, there are uh, universities like our universities, they are spending a lot of money for, for example, for Bloomberg or for financial data. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's more than this, uh, some that I. Uh, just match. Yeah. I wonder if you are subscribing to. Sorry. I wonder if you are subscribing to the indexes by clarity, like the PI. Sorry. Thank you. SCI is that kind of index? What yes. about Thomson yeah. Reuters? Yeah. And and whether it comes as a burden to the library budget? Um. I'm not sure whether I understand you right. What was the question that we are using uh, metrics like from the Web of Science? Uh, yeah, whether you're subscribing to the yeah. industry. So you're, are, you, are you paying to get to the industry? Like, this index is? Yeah, you get uh, the, 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 the general in, uh, terminal impact factor, for example, is in the package with the Web of Science uh, uh, database. So, so I wonder if the expense for Web of Science Subscription is, you know, kind of yeah. The index is not available 
alone or the very expense, but when you buy it together with the Web of Science database, it's an add-on. There are other metrics like this one I mentioned from Elsevier that are free available on the web. So, there was another question. Yeah. If I got it correctly, you don't think it's a very good idea if the market share of the big publishers is increasing and increasing? No. Right? Yes. Uh, so what we need competition. Expect, what would you expect if we get a big deal on publishing as well? Because I would expect that the market share of the big publishers to be something around 95%. When there's no big deal? When there is a big deal. There are already big deals. For publishing, I mean, not, not for reading, for publishing. Um, there are reader, so the, the, the discussions also in German, the deal discussions are about reading publishing or publishing and reading. When I understand it, why the German libraries say we pay enough for it, we want to have the same amount spent, but we want to have access to all the journals and we want to be pub uh, to publishing, uh, what makes this partial publishing for all of our authors. I think that's their statutory. Uh, I have no insight, but uh, so I understand. Um, it's, I understand your question that this could be a problem for the small publishers and for Opmexis publishers who want to start up and get into this business because the incentive structure is to publish with Elsewhere, Wiley and so on. But, but what I wanted to say with this slide is you have to address this problem, the incentive structure. When the incentive structure of our university is not we are paying you, our university is paying a financial reward when we are, we are publishing these higher impact journals, but when we are paying you when we are when you are uh, publishing in a small publishing house or with of Maxis, then this incentive structure will change uh, to the to the favor of small publishing houses. Yeah, thank you for uh, turning light on this elephant in the room that is the incentive structure that we all from the technological side of want to think about because it's highly complex to get into and to solve. But I think. Um, with public uh, libraries and uh, universities, it's actually them making the decision on which publishing house or whatever platform you make a contract with, yeah. not so much uh, the researchers themselves. Even more if you go towards big deals, um, but we have, like, you can choose Elsevier or Springer or whatever, but not this one because we don't have a big deal with them. The same. Um, if, uh, if, from your perspective, uh, the financials are also always relevant, I guess, you have to meet your budget. Um, if we came to a situation where authors were paid for their work per download or however, yeah. um, if that researcher is employed by a public, a, a public uh, university, then we could think about um, this additional revenue not going into the pockets of this uh, researcher, but into the budget of the university. So that would create an incentive for the university in the long run to, to change towards a system where authors are um, rewarded. My point with the half time is that I think it's not just about financial rewards and so on. Not, not for the, the, not not for the author, author, not, not for, for the university. university. It's about the social capital. We have a Nobel Prize, we have an author in the, this uh, journal. It's more important than the, the money that you would get for one article in a specific book. But then, I think, in, in yeah. one way, I would say one way road, then, towards 100% market penetration of the big five. Yeah. No, I think it would probably, my, my, I think what you're saying is completely right. The takeaway from, from your talk is, okay, blockchain is a tool, it's a technology that will be able to make, allow us maybe more peer-to-peer -peer publishing methods, which we have been discussing in the morning. But it will not, as long as our, the KPIs, the incentives of the universities is to publish in, have a certain number of publications in specific journals, uh, the monopoly of these specific journals will not be broken. And I think it's a two-sided approach. One is um, changing the mindset and saying like, I don't, like starting to boycott certain journals, you know, or starting to change the incentive system university by university. And the other thing is, but you will only be able to do that once you have alternative systems that are reliable and practical. So I think it will be a gradual process. 
I don't know. It's, I think in the publishing uh, industry it's the same as with, uh, with Apple and Google and so on. So they are monitoring what startups are uh, coming up. Yeah. Joining them, buying them, integrating their technology into their services, and maybe this will happen with the big publishers and this blockchain. I don't know. Last remark, please. Last question. And the other institutional partner that I think is really strategically important here are things like the royal societies in, in royal countries, right? So to be a member of uh, the esteemed scientific body, it should be a requirement that you publish openly. And if you don't, you should be kicked out of the scientific body. Right? Yes. That institution, you see, has no problem saying like that if it's good for science. A university is in a difficult strategic position to but the royal body, or the, the science bodies whose remit is to look at the overall structure of science, should have no problem saying that. Yeah. If they change their policy, other people would have to follow. Yeah. It's never going to happen because most London societies rely on closed access for most yeah. of us. Uh, I used to work for one and derive most of our revenue from subscriptions. Yeah. Well, I think Telling they need to go to the and penalize their members to so contribute so that revenue. The society publishers are not better than the major publishers. The opportunity word there, though, is social capital. Instead of, we're not talking about money, we're talking about access to people. So if you get a community that's strong enough to combat the entrenched interests, then you have a chance. But if you're fighting fire with fire, you're not going to win that battle. I, I think you're right. They'll just buy up anything that looks good, and they'll still be the same players in 10, 20 years. No, but, but this reminds me of the discussions we had, like we, we always had, that the incentive structures had to change. But in the blockchain revolution now, we, we can like change these incentive structures, right? And we can change the way science is funded. And uh, so they, they, I'm always citing this first ICO for research projects that happened. And if we now like structure and provide guidelines how ICOs in science, or token for ideas and this platform building it, so we can change the incentive structures, right? And this is different from the revolutions that happened before, because before we always relied on uh, politicians, universities who are under the influence of the millions of the publishers and lobbyists to change, and now we are like in a situation to build a new system. And maybe before, they don't understand it at the moment, they start to understand what's happening. But we have like a head start of like one year or one and a half years. I've heard the line, my crime is that I'm old. Uh, I'm also old and I lived in the 90s when, when there was a lot of uh, 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 fantasy and what, what the web will change. And, yeah, uh, that's right. The, the, the decentralization argument was in place in this time as well. Yeah. And now we have Google, Amazon and Facebook. Yeah, that's right. That was the economic model of the web. The only way to make money is from advertising, so as a consequence you get that. So if you don't address the economic sustainability of these projects and you just do them all startup based, we will end up with like the web again. We need to address the economic incentives of publishing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm happy to introduce John Tennant now. I'm happy to introduce John Tennant. He's a paleontologist, a dinosaur researcher, a blogger. His blog is called Fossil and Shit. Right? Fossil and Shit. And, uh, but to most of you, he, he's known as an open science blogger and the founder of the Open Science Multi Online User Course. Right? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. And there's a critic uh, subtitle that I really like. Yeah, okay, thanks, Eka. Yeah, I think Zenker invited me here to be a bit provocative about blockchain for science, so I'm going to try and do that quite heavily. Um, I am a paleontologist, I'm a researcher, not a blockchain expert, though, so bear with. Um, hopefully you all know what open science is. We've heard a lot about the technical aspects of it this time, which is like rigor, transparency, the reproducibility crisis. These are all fairly common things that have came up throughout the course of today and in past uh, publishing events. But no one's really talked about the socio cultural aspects of science today, which I think like inclusive, does this thing work? Uh, yeah, inclusivity, equality, accountability, freedom, 
fairness, justice, and truth. And these are sort of like the underpinning principles of the open science movement, which I see sort of blockchain being part of. Uh, but no one's talked about these, so it's kind of strange that we've missed that out. Um, yeah, that's just like my stutter anyway. <coughs> also, we haven't really talked much about governance. So when this was announced on Twitter, this event, we had a, a librarian from Utrecht and the comms director of Elsevier both chime in and basically say that you can't replace human-led governance with the blockchain. Like, it's fairly naive to think that you can do something like that. Um, and hopefully they want to be convinced through the recordings and talks today that blockchain can be a sustainable replacement replacement for current governance structures and scholarly communication. So far, again, I don't think we've mentioned that, and that's probably like the second elephant in the room after the impact factor. Um, I think we're all pretty clear that the future of scholarly publishing has to be decentralized, and not just decentralized, but out of the hands of Springer Nature, Elsevier, Telem Francis, and all of the others, okay? But as this came up so many times in the conversations today alone, like, I don't think half of you understand the problems that you're trying to solve. So like, Sorry to be a bit harsh to whoever gave that talk on copyright. Like the entire talk was basically redundant because we've had that problem solved for about 300 years through a process called citation, and it's worked. It works pretty well, um, as I think someone else wrote raised that point as well. Nevertheless, I think generally we have the same sort of uh, long-term vision and strategic missions in, in class. So I stole this from the blockchain and science website. You know things like reproducibility, continuous research, and data autonomy, which is a part of government. Uh, and true innovation. And these are all sort of what open science wants to achieve, as well as blockchain for science. But the thing which is really confusing me, and a lot of researchers I speak to is, why does any of this stuff require blockchain? Because, you know, this stuff was happening before blockchain was even a thing, okay? Blockchain isn't like a magic bullet cure. And, you know, when I ask people, like, why is blockchain so important, they typically come up with, oh yeah, sorry, by the way, there are a lot of Rick and Morty references in this, so if nobody watches that, then you're not going to understand much of this talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, when people come up um, say, like, why do we need blockchain? And they give answers like, well, it's distributed. Well, so are things like torrents, another bit of thing that works, like Wikipedia. Um, it's immutable. One thing that the history of science has taught us is that consensus is actually rarely a good thing. So if you need to, like, achieve consensus to map something onto the blockchain, that's actually pretty anti-scientific and doesn't fit in with what history teaches us about the scientific process. And also other protocols like DAT do this. I think we're going to hear about DAT. We have quite a bit already. It does this very effectively already. Um, Say for decentralization, DAT does this. It doesn't rely on the blockchain. It's a peer-to-peer -peer immutable network, very similar to what blockchain is, but just not on the blockchain. It saves a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort. Um, solving the trust issue is one which we came across as well. Anybody who believes that blockchain is going to solve trust is naive, um, frankly, because you're just saying that technology is going to solve trust. It doesn't work like that at all. Any researcher will tell you this. Transparency, yes, but transparency doesn't require the blockchain. Okay? Um, yeah, there's a lot of VC in blockchain, which I guess is why a lot of people are into it as well. <laughs> um, just that last week as well, there was a really great research paper which I encourage you all to read by uh, Chris Hartwick and Rino Van Zelt. They described a novel method of scholarly communication based around more granular, decentralized methods of scholarly publishing in like an open source platform based on DAP. They basically said that it has all of the traits which people say that blockchain is good for in scholarly publishing just without the blockchain, thereby you know, using um, existing structures and procedures and standards that scientists are already familiar with to basically just do what they're doing in a better way already. Um, I haven't read the paper fully, but you know, one particular thing is that basically you know, the process they envision and are building can occur basically in line with what everybody else is saying today, but just not on the blockchain. Um, so my thing is, you can't just like go out there and just stick blockchain on a scientific concept and then expect it to be a magic solution. Okay? You know, I've seen papers in PeerJ and stuff recently saying, we're going to solve the gun control crisis on the blockchain. <laughs> or we're going to solve, you know, overfishing using blockchain. Like, these are peer-reviewed papers, and you're just like, just, just stop, okay? Like, you know, I think we need to sort of slow down and really think about the problem that we're trying to solve. You know, because you're not going to solve reproducibility using blockchain. You're going to solve reproducibility by teaching researchers about proper research standards from when they become master students or PhD students. Um, the big one is about ownership, and I'm kind of glad that people just raised the issue of copyright before. 
you're not going to win the fight against big publishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think some of us here have worked in big publishing before. Like there are deeply entrenched and profoundly corrupt copyright systems around the EU and the US, um, which the entire industry which you're trying to disrupt is going to fight tooth and nail and pour millions and millions of dollars into making sure that you don't disrupt it. So good luck with that. Um, yeah, and we know that in the EU in particular, they don't give a toss about evidence. And in fact, the current copyright direct direction uh, that the EU is taking is um, basically based on lobbying efforts from the scholarly publishing industry and other uh, media industries. And in fact, the European Commission, they can any research which uh, speaks the other way. So you're fighting against an incredibly corrupt system. Um, and when you talk to researchers as well about copyright, they're pretty low on the knowledge level when it comes to this. So, you know, most researchers don't even understand what a copyright transfer agreement was. They still believe that they own copyright after they have transferred it to a publisher. It's bizarre. Like, if you try and explain to a researcher that SciHub is illegal because it breaches copyright, or that they're not allowed to share their own research papers online because they've signed copyright away, they're just like, when did I do that? And they don't get it. And if they do get it, often they don't care. Again, because of this, uh, what was what we used before, the, the social capital involved in publishing. So when you tell people that blockchain, its main benefit to a researcher, it's all about them retaining ownership of their research, they're gonna be like, well, don't I do that anyway? Don't I have ownership over my work anyway? And then you're gonna be like, no. And you're gonna cry when you realize how silly they all are. Um, big publishing, by the way, is anyone, does anybody here work for Springer Nature, Teller and Francis, or Cambridge University Press? Good. <laughs> <laughs> so quite a few people came up with, uh, sorry, the text on this is bad. Uh, we developed um, a protocol for what peer review on the blockchain might look like. Uh, this was a couple of years ago with a combination of authors. Um, a few months ago, Springer Nature decided that they were going to build that. <laughs> and it was like, oh, crap. So, um, yeah, they've already sort of jumped the gun here. Um, Springer Nature are now officially on the blockchain. Taylor and Francis and Cambridge University Press recently joined them. So you now have three of the biggest publishers in the world basically building all of the systems that you're de uh, designing at the moment, except within the current system that you cannot disrupt because of the things I've mentioned before. Um, yeah, that's really bad. That goes basically against everything which science needs right now. Imagine just everything being on the blockchain. As these publishers move into uh, service-oriented business models, you are basically going to be, you know, suckered into using blockchain-based services where you will not only be like the content provider, but you'll be the product and the consumer yourself. And it's just, it's the last thing science needs. And you know, how long until the else are they going on the blockchain? I can't wait to see Pure, Cybal, Highbench, Scopus, and all of these, where you are basically just suckered into thinking that you know, you're going to retain some form of ownership over your research, but really at the same time you're just giving it to Elsevier so that they can sell it back to you. And this is happening right now. Okay. Um, the impact factor came up, and journal brands. I love how you're all talking about tokenized incentives and things like that. Not a single one of you has mentioned how to actually get these new incentives recognized in formal hiring, promotion, and research uh, grant schemes. Because I, I just love the idea of a researcher saying, but I published like all of this work and I got like three bitcoins for it. And then they're just like, great, if this guy published in a high impact factor journal, so you got nothing. Like, you're talking about an alternative, but you haven't created like a formal way of getting it recognized yet. And that is, again, it's fairly naive to do. Yeah, you have to say this. If anyone has ideas on how to do that, not just by creating alternative incentives, but by getting research funders to actually manage the development of those incentives around blockchain, then you might actually be on to a winner. Or we could just kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, build it and they will come. It's like the greatest fallacy that um, tech startups in the academic realm uh, suffer. You can come up with the greatest idea ever, and a lot of the ideas we've heard today are fantastic ideas, but we haven't really heard much about the people. Like I was, it was great uh, when Iris spoke and said that they had 10,000 registered users already. Wait till the end. <laughs> um, but you know, how many people actually have a user base who actually use these new services that we're using as their primary block, like service for uh, publishing? And I don't think many of you do. I know Artifacts 
built an actual working platform. How many users did you get in your first couple of weeks? Nothing. Yeah. How many users did Despite the, the fact that what you built was... How many users did the internet get in the first couple of weeks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is slow and it took a lot of development and a lot of web consortia to get that far. I don't think there are any blockchain for science consortia yet, until you see <laughs> stuff. But yeah, at the moment I believe that the technology is advancing much faster than the average researcher's um, understanding of it. <coughs> and academics, right, this is a statistic for you, 50% of academics are more stupid than the average academic. <laughs> right, just, just, just let that one sink in. <laughs> most of them don't understand copyright, most of them don't understand publishing, most of them don't understand peer review, most of them don't understand how the impact factor is calculated, and even if they do, they don't care. And it's this system of cultural inertia, right? If there was a way to defeat the impact factor, maybe people who've been fighting against it in the last 50 years would have been successful in doing so. But we haven't been. It's getting more entrenched. And it's because of this publish or perish mentality. Providing an alternative system that works better is not going to help because the, uh, you know, like we keep saying, the incentive system is backwards. And we're asking too much of researchers in terms of risk in this case. Um, but yeah, you know, like you just said, you know, people don't think the web would work. People also predicted that Elsevier would be the web's first fix. That didn't happen. So we're generally, well, researchers in general are pretty bad at making predictions about the future of technology. If you look five years ago, people said open access was never going to happen. If you look two years ago, people said open peer review was never going to happen. If you look six months ago, people said preprints are never going to happen. Right now, people like me are saying, well, blockchain for science is never going to happen. And each of those predictions have been basically generally wrong. So, yeah, but the world has them, but it'll be I'll say here and um, uh, why they'll be doing it all. Sorry? That a lot of the people in this room might end up working for those large publishers. Oh dear, well, they should probably reconsider their career path then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, as well, you know, people keep saying my target audience are researchers. Researchers are an incredibly diverse bunch, including like humanists, social scientists, philosophers, political scientists, biologists, physicists, chemists, all with their own cultural norms, social processes, different ways of communicating, different ways of interacting, and creating like a single uniform service to, uh, a pro uh, for each one of those uh, communities to adopt, again, is, is oversimplifying things. So for example, um, a great example of how not to do that was uh, the initiative called WeSci, which was launched uh, about six months ago, or CodeOcean. Both of them built really great platforms tailored towards a specific scientific community. Not only does it make your marketing much, much easier, but it also means that you can provide tailored uh, or bespoke solutions for exactly the problems that those individual communities are having. So when somebody says science is facing a reproducibility crisis, that's basically a lie, okay? Quantitative psychology is facing a reproducibility crisis. Some aspects of medicine are facing a reproducibility crisis. Pretty sure, you know, no one's tested it for chemistry or physics or geology or anything yet, okay? So you can't just say this is a solution for all scientists. Um, yeah, so the risks of, basically, if we, I feel like if we continue in the same sort of trajectory that we've heard today, the risks are that we're just going to end up replicating the present system, including all of its downfalls. So we'll just end up recreating 